This is forever. This is forever. This is forever. Forever I am saved by your love. To our papa and mama, Doctors Abel and Rachel Daminer, we wish you a happy and a blessed 29th marriage anniversary. All over the world today, your collective impact is massively felt across continent, nations, and tribes. We bless the Lord for such a wonderful gift and blessing you both are to the world. Many more years of blanketing the whole earth with the fragrance of Jesus grace together. Happy marriage anniversary. Amen. You can be seated with your sweet smart self. Grab your pen, your notebook and your Bible. Let's get into the word of his grace this morning. Praise God. And let's continue with our series on reflecting the father. Reflecting the father. Matthew chapter 28 verse 18 to 20. Matthew 28, 18 to 20. And Jesus came and spake unto them saying, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always. Even unto the end of the world. Amen. Last Sunday, we began to explore these, you know, these realities. And we said when Jesus was teaching, he was teaching from the word of God. And we established that the word of God was not Colossians or Ephesians or Romans. The word of God there where Jesus was teaching from was Genesis to Malachi. Because when Jesus was teaching, there was no New Testament as we call it today. All right. And you know, I did some explanation on the word New Testament and on the word Old Testament. So when Jesus was saying all power in heaven and on earth is given to me, there was no New Testament for the purpose of this study. There was no Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, down to Revelation. All they had was Genesis to Malachi. And Genesis to Malachi is the word of God. All right? And we said it's the translators that took the privilege of demarcating the Bible into two segments. But otherwise, when you are properly taught, you will not notice that demarcation as Old Testament and New Testament. You will look at the Bible as one singular book that contains one singular revelation and this revelation has to be you know has to be found in the books when the books are so rightly divided rightly dividing the word of truth is critical in fact it is the acid test for the truth of god's word it must be rightly divided and so we began to say that jesus therefore referred to the scriptures as the prophets because in Luke chapter 24, verse 25, the first extensive and exhaustive Bible study that Jesus will have after his resurrection from the dead, which was more authoritative and which was superior to the parables he taught before he died. In Luke 24, 25, when he met the disciples on the way to Emmaus, he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets that the prophets have spoken. All that the prophets have spoken ought not Christ. So what the prophets spoke, if you were paying attention, you will have known that the context and the content of their message was that the Christ ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory and now to cure them of that foolishness beginning at Moses and all the prophets. So that is where Jesus taught from. He always taught from Moses and all the prophets. He expounded unto them in all the scriptures 
the things concerning himself. So Jesus being the word of God concerning himself. John called Jesus the Logos, the logic of God or God's thinking pattern or the reason behind. John called Jesus the ideology of God. He called Jesus God's thinking pattern. The reason behind the reason behind the prophecy of the prophets. The reason behind the types and the shadows. The reason behind the speakings of the Old Testament as we call it. He called the scriptures, John called the scriptures the message of the Christ. He called him the Logos, the Logos of God. In the beginning, which refers to Genesis, was the word. So when Jesus taught, he taught the word of God from Genesis to Malachi. Look at that, Luke chapter 24, verse 44. Luke chapter 24, verse 44. And he said unto them, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you. That all things must be fulfilled, all things. And of course, you know, I've taught you, when you see the word all things, he's not talking about all things. He's talking about all these things within that context. All these things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Next verse. Then when he explained that to them, that helped to open their understanding. The word dinogio, it means to split their understanding open for the first time that they might understand. The second understand there is the word tsunami in the Greek. It means a collection of facts together. That is Jesus put the facts of the Old Testament together and by the putting of those facts together, their understanding was was open to see that Jesus was the message of the scriptures. The message of the scriptures. That means you must be careful how you read the scriptures. You know, the Bible tells us Jesus expounded the word diharmonia. That means he walked through the interpretation. The word expounded does not mean to cross over. If you remember, the word expanded means to go through, to cut across. So Jesus cut across Genesis, cut across the prophets. And in the cutting across the books of Genesis and the prophets, he brought out the things concerning himself when he did that the disciples now understood that oh so this is all that the scriptures were communicating their understanding was open to the truth then we said the first thing you need to do with the writings of genesis to malachi is to understand the language you must understand the language when studying the Bible, don't get a Webster's Dictionary. You will be in the bush. In fact, not bush. You will land in the desert. Because the Bible is not just English. The Bible has its own language. So you must understand the language. Then you must understand the context of the events within the language. The context of the events within the language. Those two things are very critical. The language and the context of the events. What was going on when these words were said? When you understand that, then you come to your own world today. Like, you know, Jesus did in Luke 24, 25 to 27. So, we now began to arrive at a concept of interpretation of scripture called the identification unifiers. The identification unifiers, which means you look at what happens years ago and what's happening today to see what's common. What is common between the two different worlds? Then you discover what is the theology in what was said and then you apply it. What was the theology in what was said and then you apply it. <clears throat> now, you don't apply until you understand. You don't apply anything in scripture until you understand. Second Timothy chapter 3 verse 16 tells us all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, 
for instruction in righteousness. Now, let me ask you a very simple question, and I want you to, you know, I want you to answer me, you know, in a chorus. So, can I grow spiritually with my understanding of Genesis to Malachi? That means I can grow spiritually just by reading Genesis to Malachi? Huh? All right. Why? Because it's the word of God. And because Matthew to Revelation was taken out of the Old Testament. It was taken out. Okay? Matthew to Revelation. But much more specifically, Acts to Revelation. Now, so that means what Jesus is teaching is Genesis to Malachi. When he declared in Matthew 28, 20, Lo, I am with you always. Which is the word Yahweh in the Greek is the word ego am I. E-G-O-E-M-I. Ego am I. Yahweh in the Hebrew, ego am I in the Greek. Same. Is the exact meaning of that word. I am what I am. I will be what I will be. Ego am I or Yahweh. I am what I am. I will be what I will be. Stay with those words. They will help you in a bit. So we establish why is God called Father? Why do we call God Father? In today's world, father and mother, when we talk of father, we think of mother. But you see, that's, that's in today's world. That is not the old, that's not the scriptural concept. So Genesis chapter 12, verse number 3. <clears throat> Let's begin to walk. Genesis chapter 12, verse number 3. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that cursed thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Did you observe the word families? If your Bible is mine, we'll underline families in Genesis 12. <laughs> families in Genesis 12. A believer must learn to focus on God's word. You know, the word will come and go. But the word of God abides forever. Our life in God and God's word is meant to produce a counterculture. God's word is meant to produce a counterculture. And our life in Christ ought to be a counterculture. Counter narrative. Counter life in itself. God's word. And God's life in us is meant to be a counterculture, counter narrative, and counter life in itself. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 2 to 3 again, let's see God speaking to Abraham. Genesis chapter 12, verse 2. Genesis 12, 2. <clears throat> Whoever is on the computer, you need to walk with me. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing. Next verse. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curse thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. In thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. If your Bible was mine, I will underline in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Then after underlining it, I will put God's promise to Abraham. That was the promise. In thee shall all families, families of the earth be blessed. Families is the same word for nations. Families, nations. When you have a nation in mind, you have a family in mind. When you have a nation in mind, you have a family in mind. When family is in your mind, a father is in the picture. When family is in your mind, a father is in the picture. Genesis chapter 12 verse number 7. Genesis chapter 12 verse number 7. 
And the Lord appeared unto Abraham and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. Unto thy seed. Underline the word thy seed. The word seed there means is a Greek word zera. In the Greek seed, zera. It means a person or a group of persons. Seed. A person, a group of persons, a family, or a nation. The word seed means a person, a group of persons, a family, or a nation. Remember, in Genesis 3.15, God gave a promise of the seed of the woman after the fall of man. The seed of the woman. All right, so God now is talking about seed again to Abraham. God talked about seed to Abraham, Adam, and Eve. Now, God is re echoing the same thing He told Adam and Eve after the fall in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. The seed of the woman shall bruise the head of the serpent. So now, God is repeating, In thy seed shall all families of the earth be blessed. So the next question will be, how will this happen? It will happen through Abraham. What God said to Adam and Eve in Genesis 3.15 will take effect through Abraham. In thy seed. Watch this. Watch this. God said to Adam and Eve, he said the seed of the woman. He didn't say thy seed. He said the seed. So he, he put forth to them a promise that he was going to fulfill. When he came to Abraham, God said to Abraham, thy seed, thy seed. In thy seed shall all families of the earth be blessed. Adam and Eve, the seed of the woman. Abraham, in thy seed. Take note of that difference there because I, I, I'm, I'm going to tie it together in a bit. All right, so, so Abraham, in thy seed, which is the fulfillment of the promise in Genesis 3.15, is going to happen through Abraham. Now, Genesis 12 verse 3 and Genesis 12 by 7 where we read is through Abraham that the seed or the families of the earth will be blessed. The seed of the woman shall bruise the head of the serpent was God's announcement of redemption. And Abraham, in your seed shall that promise be fulfilled. All right, now. So that settles that God has a nation. God has a family in mind. God has a family in mind. So this nation, which is also a family, that means is a nation amongst a nation. A family amongst families. Because there were families when God was talking. Huh. And there were nations when God was talking. So it means there will be a nation amongst nations and a family amongst families. Mm. Genesis 17 verse 1. Stay with me. Genesis chapter 17 verse number 1. And when Abraham was 90 years old and 9, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said unto him, I am the almighty God, Shaddai. I am the almighty God, walk before me and be thou perfect. The word Shaddai, it means I am sufficient. I am sufficient. Why would he say I am sufficient? Remember, God made promise to Abraham in chapter 12 of Genesis. And by chapter 15, Abraham is wondering, how will it happen? How? Maybe it will happen through Eliezer, my servant. God said, no. That's not how it is going to happen. Remember Genesis 15. Abraham said to God. What will you give me seeing I go childless. And this Eliezer which is my servant is all I have. And you are promising me all, all kinds of things. 
How will this promise come to pass? Is it going to come to pass through Eliezer, my house boy? Is it going to happen through my house boy? Because to me, you have given no seed. There's no direct seed. And only Eliezer. And you're promising me the nations of the earth. Is it going to happen through Eliezer? Then later on in Genesis chapter 16, Abraham had a maid by the name Hagar, and Hagar had a child for Abraham called Ishmael. All right, so still, Abraham doesn't have a direct child. He has a child out of marriage. Then he has a houseboy called Eliezer. And God is saying, in thy seed. So Abraham is wondering, could it be Eliezer or could it be Ishmael? Maybe much more Ishmael. So that's, that means there's Ishmael born by Abraham. And he said, no, Ishmael is not it. God said to Abraham, it cannot be Ishmael. There is an Isaac on the way. There is an Isaac on the way. Abraham, I am sufficient. I do not need help to bring what I promise when I give promise, I do not give promise depending on your resources. I give promise depending on my resources because I am self-sufficient. So you don't have to figure out how it will happen. You just walk with me and you will see what I say come to pass. Alright, now stay with me. So if you were Abraham, you will just be looking. God said I'm sufficient. The word Shaddai. I am sufficient to fulfill what I have said. Observe that what God is saying to Abraham is that I will do what I said I will do. So Abraham is meant to come along in what God will do in the earth. Abraham is meant to come along in what God will do on the earth. So that word is called covenant. That word is called covenant, which is the word berith in the Hebrew. Berith. Berith. It means just be my ally in doing this. I want to do it. I have all the resources. I just need you to be my ally. You don't have to do anything. I have all the resources. Just be my ally. That's what we call covenant. Now, which means the promise of God is centered around Christ. Man becomes a beneficiary of it. The promise of God is centered around Christ. Man is only a beneficiary of it. So, that beneficiary is why the word covenant. Because there is a beneficiary, that is why the word covenant. A confederacy. The beneficiary is where the word partnership is used. Partnership. Partnership. The promise was not for Abraham to do it. It was for Abraham to believe it. The promise was not for Abraham to do it. It was only for Abraham to believe it. Oh, yeah. Look at me, everybody. God cannot just come to the earth and just do what he wants to do. Huh. He has to have an ally. An ally who gives him access into earth. He has everything he needs. But he needs an ally so he can legally carry out that promise in the domain called earth which he has given to men. And since he is not a man, he will have to have a partner in men that grants him the legal access to release his resources on the earth. Clear? Okay, now. So Abraham, be my ally who carries out the promise. God. That is why he is sufficient. He is sufficient because he will be the one to carry out the promise. 
So two things we see. Number one, which means that the seed will be performed by who? God. So if the seed is Isaac, the seed of Abraham, if the seed is Isaac, so Isaac is a teaching lesson. Isaac is a teaching lesson. Isaac comes out of a dead body. Isaac comes out of a dead body. A body that couldn't have a child. The deadness of Abraham's body and the deadness of Sarah's womb. So Isaac comes out of the dead. Because Isaac is a teaching lesson. Abraham saw my days. Ah, and he was glad. Are you following? Now. <clears throat> Isaac. Comes out of Sarah. A free woman. Who is not a slave. Which means that this will be done not from bondage. God is going to raise a nation from bondage. He will raise a nation from bondage. God is going to raise a nation in freedom. He is going to raise a nation from the resurrection. Teaching good? Stay with me. It's a story. It's a story. God uses their story to explain his promise. God uses their story to explain his promise. Their story is not his promise. The story of Abraham and Isaac is not his promise. But God will use their story to explain his promise. Am I teaching good? Yeah. God will use their story to communicate his promise. So, their story is only a means of communicating God's promise. So, not the bond woman, but the free woman. Not the servant, but the son. Not the son from the bond woman, but the son from the free woman. Are you following? Uh, Romans chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4. Okay? Two sons. The allegory. You remember? The woman from Sinai. Huh? which is Arabia, which generated to bondage. Hagar is in bondage with her children and the free woman, Jerusalem, which is above, which is the mother of us all. So what say the scripture? Cast out the bond woman with her son, for it is written that the bond woman and her son shall not inherit the promise with the free woman. You remember the allegory? You can read it at home. Stay with me. So if you know that their story is not the story. <laughs> but their story is a pointer to his story. Their story is not his story, but their story is a pointer to his story. Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Ishmael, Hagar. According to that story, he was buried and rose again from the dead according to their story. Ayabada. Hey. He was buried and he rose again according to their story. 
If you are with me, shout a loud amen. Okay, so I can push on now. So in the story of man is hidden the story of God. In the story of man is hidden the story of God. That also shows us as we are about to see that therefore being the father of the nations which will also be done by God. The father of the nations. So within the story of Abraham, God gave to Abraham a signpost. An idea of what he will do in the earth. Glory to God. So a nation, therefore, is a man here. And the father is God walking through Abraham. Let's pause there. I didn't say stop. What did I say? Pause. And let's flip over to the prophets. Remember, Jesus taught from Moses and the prophets. So, Isaiah chapter 9, verse, I mean chapter 7, verse number 14. Isaiah chapter 7, verse number 14. Therefore, the Lord himself, the all-sufficient one, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel. God is able to do what he says. Listen everybody. If God needs you to fulfill his promise, then his word has no integrity. If God will need you to help him fulfill his promise, then his word has no integrity. <laughs> integrity means when I say it, I do it. It doesn't mean when I say it, you do it. That's not integrity. <laughs> integrity means if I say I will come, I come. So if God will give promise and depend on you to carry out his promise. Then his word lacks integrity. Then that means God cannot be relied upon. Then that means we can't trust him. The word integrity means he is one God. It means he is one. It means God's word is faithful. That's integrity. God's word is faithful. That's why the apostles will call it a promise. The word epangelia in the Greek. Epangelia, that which I commit to do myself. Epangelia, that which I commit to do myself. So if he promise a seed, he will do it himself. If he promised the father of many nations, it means he will do it himself. If he promised redemption, it means he will do it himself. Whatever he promised, he will do. What's my role? I believe it. I am the believer. I'm not the performer. I am the believer. I'm not the performer. My job is just to believe. Abraham believed in the Lord, Genesis 15 verse 6, and it was credited to his account righteousness. He believed. Unto him that believeth, unto him that believeth, okay, not perform it, unto she that walketh not, but believe it on him that has promised. It is counted to him righteousness. He walketh not. I'm just a believer. Abraham believed. And it was credited or counted for him righteousness. Stay with me. 
E.W. Kenyon, a theologian I respect so much, E.W. Kenyon calls it an unqualified committal. An unqualified. That God is giving you an unqualified committal. Or what we call grace. Unqualified, undeserving, yet God gives you a quality commitment. What's a quality commitment? It is a commitment from which there is no retreat. An unqualified committal. That is a commitment that is not dependent on you, but a commitment that is dependent on him. Meaning whatever you do doesn't change it. If you like, be as, be as sinful as sinful can be, he will still die for you. If you like, insult him while dying. He will not change his mind. Because the commitment is not based on you. The commitment is based on him. However, you will be the beneficiary. I'm teaching? Yeah. You will be the beneficiary. That's why all these people... <laughs> you know, there's need for teaching in the body of Christ. A lot of teaching is required because... Sometimes I even pity the people who just keep wowing their mouth when we teach. I pity them because it's a case of a blind man that is arguing that the light, the sun is shining. We are telling him, look at light. He said, idiot, how can there be light? There cannot be light. Everywhere is dark. No. It's a mortuary case. Is a mortuary situation. So sometimes we just pray for them. That's all. No, there's nowhere to start explaining. Just pray for them. You understand? Just pray for them. That's all. Before I would have been angry, but now I, I, it's a lot of compassion. I feel pity for such people. You see them breaking a lot of English in the mortuary. <laughs> Hallelujah. It calls for help. It calls for prayer and, and sympathy. Just feel for them. Especially when they are arrogant about it. Just. Father, forgive him. He doesn't know what he's doing. <laughs> that kind of prayer only comes when you don't know what to do about somebody. Father, don't take him serious. Father, don't be angry. Don't take him serious. <laughs> this one doesn't know what he's doing. <laughs> I'm not taking him serious. Uh, he doesn't know what he's saying. How can you say God does not kill? Then who killed the Egyptians in the rain? <laughs> You're not even asking. It's not like you're asking a question to be helped. And you're being arrogant about it. What's there to be here arrogant about illiteracy? And most times it's illiterates that are arrogant. You see a poor man lifting his shoulder up. Back to our subject. Abraham just threw himself over to what God said without proof. No proof. That's why it is called faith. No proof of it. God said it. It must be real. I believe. That's why Christianity is called. It's called the faith. The faith. All Abraham had from God was what God said. Now, what is the reason for miracles? 
What is the reason for miracles? Stay with me. The reason for miracles is to give a signboard to an eventual event. The reason for miracles is to give you a signboard to an eventual event. So, Isaac was a miracle, but Isaac was not the promise. Isaac was a miracle, but Isaac was not the promise. Isaac was a miracle. That's why a miracle is called a sign. He is a sign or a miracle is a sign of a future event. So the birth of Isaac was a miracle. Abraham being able to conceive at that age was a miracle. I was dead. It was a miracle. Was it not a miracle? So which means just like Abraham was able to have children even after being pronounced dead. God is going to raise sons from the dead. I don't know if I'm talking to somebody here. That Abraham, after being pronounced dead, produced a child, was a sign that the children of God will be brought from the dead. Jesus, the first begotten from the dead. The church came out of the dead. And from the dead, he has brought many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. For both he that sanctified and they that are sanctified are all of one. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. He had quickened us together, raised us up together made us sit together with him where in the heavenlies far above all principalities and powers so just like abraham had a child from a dead body god produces children from the resurrection from the dead so which means abraham sarah the conception of isaac was the message of death, burial, resurrection, and the production of children being communicated to Abraham by God in typology. Am I teaching? Stay with me. So, here, Isaac is the miracle. Christ is the promise. Uh -huh. Isaac is the miracle. Christ is the promise in his resurrection. Abraham is a miracle. God is the promised father. Abraham is the miracle. God is the promised father. So, the miracle is never the end. The miracle is the means to show the end. The miracle is the means to show you the end. The end is always beyond the miracle. The end is always beyond the miracle. So, here we are. Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14. Are you getting blessed? Isaiah 7 14. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. A sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and shall bear and bear a son and shall call his name what? Emmanuel. Emmanuel. The word Emmanuel or the word son, 
son shall bear a son is the word ben in the Hebrew. B-E-N. Son. B-E-N. Ben in the Hebrew. Emmanuel is an existing name. It is an existing name. Emmanuel was not a new name coined for Christ. It was a name people were using. Okay? So Emmanuel is an existing name. Look at Isaiah chapter 8 verse 8. So you know that people bought that name. And he shall pass through Judah. He shall overflow and go over. He shall reach even to the neck. And the stretching out of his wings shall fill the breath of thy land. Oh, Emmanuel. So, Emmanuel, if you just back up a little bit, is actually the son of Isaiah. Isaiah had a son called Emmanuel. So, Isaiah gives birth to a son and calls his name Emmanuel. Isaiah chapter 8 verse 9 and 10. Mm -mm, stay with me. Isaiah, associate yourselves, O ye people, and you shall be broken in pieces. And give ear, all ye, all ye of far countries, guard yourselves, and you shall be broken in pieces. Guard yourselves, and you shall be broken in pieces. Verse 10. Take counsel together, and it shall come to naught. Speak the word and it shall not stand. Why? Emmanuel. God is with us. It means that in our troubles and travails, God will come to us and identify with us. In our troubles and travails, God will come to us and identify with us. So, when in Isaiah 8, Isaiah has his own child, then Isaiah says in Isaiah 8, 18, Isaiah chapter 8, verse number 18, Behold, I and the children whom the Lord had given me are for signs and for wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts, which dwelleth in Mount Zion. That scripture was Isaiah's proclamation. Which means he now has children to identify what God will do to Israel. He is not referring to your own children. Isaiah had a child that became a sign and a wonder. A sign and a wonder of what God will do. Are you following? Are you following? Okay. He had a child that became a sign and a wonder of what God will do. He became a sign and wonder of what God intends to do in Jesus. I am the children that God has given to me. That is, the Lord has given to Isaiah. I and the children that God has given to Isaiah are for signs and wonders in Israel. Are you following? He's not talking to you. He didn't say, I and the children that God will give to me. I and the children that God has given to me, prophet Isaiah. We are communicating a message. We are a sign. We are not the message. We are signposts pointing to the message. Sign. A sign points to the destination. A sign is not the destination. If you are going to Nigeria Waniba Road and you keep seeing signboard and the arrow is pointing downward, what are you supposed to be doing? Are you supposed to hold the sign and say, I have arrived. I have arrived. I have arrived. No. You keep following the sign. And when you arrive at the destination, the sign will say, here. And you will not see a further sign. 
then you know that that's the destination. So a sign, whenever God gives a sign, it is a pointer to an end. A sign is not an end in itself. Okay? Now, so Isaiah said, I and the children that God has given to me, Isaiah, we are communicating a message. That is, the Lord has given to Isaiah, therefore sign. A sign is not the promise. A sign is to show you the promise. So, by calling it Emmanuel, there are two words in there. The Hebrew im and the word el. I am and E-L. Two words. Emmanuel. I am and E-L. Where you have Elion, Eloha, Elium. It deals with deities or supernatural beings. Im. Im is often used as a preposition. I am. El. Eloha. Elion. El Elion. El Gibor. El. Deities or supernatural beings. While Im, I am, is often used as a preposition. I am. It is used as he and she in it. And that's critical now. Stay with me. If you miss here, you shouldn't have been in service. I am involves he or she in it. So when you hear him is male and female. Genesis 3, 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her. Her husband with her. Her husband with her. Her husband with her. And he did eat. Male, female. All right? Describing Adam and Eve. So the word I am or him occurs first in scripture as male and female in Genesis 3.6. The law of first mention. Husband and wife. That preposition therefore comes in a form for reproduction. It comes in a form for reproduction. Emmanuel which means God coming through man. To fulfill his promise. Or let's say, to have his family. God coming through man to have his family. So Isaiah is only seen by prophecy. Repeating what God has promised to Abraham, which began with Adam and Eve. Isaiah 9.6 Isaiah 9 verse 6. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. He is the Lord of glory. He is a great I am. You know the song, right? The Alpha and Omega. The beginning and the end. His name is wonderful. The Prince of Peace is. The everlasting Father. Through all eternity. You know. I was a choir master, right? <laughs> it's ancient and modern. Hey! He's the Lord of glory. 
Don't tempt me, right? <laughs> Remember, when Isaiah is saying all of this, where are they reading from? Huh? Where are they reading from? Genesis to Malachi. His name shall be called. They are quoting from Genesis to Malachi. I mean, Genesis to Deuteronomy. Now, but precisely from Genesis. Because that was their own study material. The prophets studied Genesis to Deuteronomy. Okay? While Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John studied the prophets. While Acts studied the gospels. While the epistles studied, I mean, Acts to the whole of the epistles studied from the Old Testament or what we call Genesis to the Gospels. Now, I'm going to do a lot on that in the next service, okay? So when he says, unto us a child is born, is the word you lad, a son is given. He is making a reference to something we must have missed out from in the course of this study. And I want to factor it in before we close. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Genesis chapter 4 verse 25 mm -mm. Genesis 4 25 mm -mm -mm. and Adam knew his wife again and she bore a son and called his name Seth for God said she hath appointed me another instead another seed instead of Abel whom Cain slew 26 verse 26 and to set to him also there was born a son and he called his name Enos then began men to call upon the name of the Lord this is something Eve said by the time they had Enos the word Enos means mortal it means frail it means weak Mortal, frail, weak, enos. Now, whatever assumption Eve had, look up everybody, look up everybody, look up everybody, stop your notes. After the fall, Adam and Eve, God said to Adam and Eve, she shall bring forth a seed, and the seed she shall, she shall, and the seed of the woman shall bruise the head of the serpent. That's the promise. When Eve had, she shall bring forth. Eve thought it was her. Because she was a she. And the seed of the woman shall bruise. So when Eve gave birth to Cain and Abel, she thought it was Cain that was the seed. That will bruise the head of the serpent. So when Cain killed Abel. She knew it was neither Abel nor Cain. Because the seed that will bruise the head of the serpent. Cannot be a murderer. And the seed that will bruise the head of the serpent. Cannot be murdered. Because in the assumption of Eve. She assumed that the promise of the Messiah. Was going to be born by her. So as she was giving birth to children, she gave them names that identified the mission of redemption. But the children were not acting according to redemption's purpose. So she gave up on Cain, gave up on Abel. Then Seth came. She said, this man is from the Lord. That is, she assumed that Seth is the one that will bruise the head of the serpent. Then Seth didn't bring anything. Then she brought the last child, Enos. And when that, by the time Enos was born, it dawned on her that <laughs> you are not the one. No. So she called her child mortality. You are mortal. You will soon die. <laughs> she gave up because <laughs> her assumptions didn't work out. Didn't pan out. Are you following here? Hello. Are, are, you, are, are you following here? Okay. Her assumptions didn't work out. The seed of the promise. 
cannot be subject to death. So Isaiah now is saying to us, the child is born, the son is given. Why? Genesis 4.1. Genesis 4.1. And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain. What did she say when she bore Cain? I have gotten a man from the Lord. See her assumptions? She assumed that Cain is the man that will destroy the head of the serpent. And then Cain became a murderer. Those were Eve's assumptions. When even she had Cain, she was still thinking that that is a promise. But Cain was in the promise. Like Abraham, you know, Abraham too had assumptions. Abraham said, Lord, can it be Eliezer? Will the seed be Eliezer? Then Ishmael came. Will it be Ishmael? Then Isaac came. She said, the seed must be Isaac. Then when they got to Mount Moriah, it became clear that the seed is not Isaac. Isaac is put on the altar and God said, take him out. There's a ram. It will not be him. On the mount it shall be seen. What you are carrying is not the seed. But when you get to the mount, it shall be seen. And when they got on the mount, it was seen that Isaac cannot be the seed. There is a seed tied that will die in the place of Isaac. So take Isaac out. Let that seed die. Abraham saw my days. So in that communication was the message of death, burial, and resurrection. Now, stay with me. I'm almost done. Are you blessed? So, Adam and Eve had assumptions. Abraham too had assumptions because, you know, all of them had the promise of God and they were searching for where it will come to pass. I don't know if I'm teaching here. They were all diligently seeking and inquiring to see where this will come to pass. So, Isaiah is saying unto us, a child is born. Unto us, a son is given. When he says a son, our mind races to Genesis. So he is repeating by prophecy the promise that God made. The government shall be upon where? His shoulder. And if the government shall be upon his shoulder, this is the seed that will crush the head of the serpent. Whoever will carry the government on his shoulder will be the seed that will put an end to the serpent. Now, the word father, everlasting father, that word father is not in the Hebrew. If you check the Hebrew lexicon, you won't see the word everlasting father. You will only see everlasting. But it is assumed because it is the same promise. The promise of a son has with it the promise of a father. Eh? The promise of a son has with it the promise of a father. Can you have a son without a father? Hey, Power City, can you have a son without a father? Okay, so the promise of El Shaddai. Oh, listen to me, everybody. The promise of El Shaddai, who as God is father, who as God is son, who as God is spirit. The almighty. I am what I am. I will be what I will be. So the word everlasting here is the Hebrew word uh, aid. A-D. It means on and on. It means now and after. And don't forget that in Exodus 6, 
When Moses went to Egypt to deliver Israel, God said, the promise which I made to the fathers, the promise which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, look at it, Exodus 6, 8. Put it up for me as I begin to round up. Exodus chapter 6, verse 8. And I will bring you in unto the land concerning the which I did swear to give it to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And I will give it to you for an heritage. I am the Lord, which I promise, I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. You will also see it repeated in Exodus 6, verse 3. So therefore, pay attention to some crucial details as I bring this class to a climax. So, what we are finding is, if God is almighty, you know that song? Almighty Father, thy will be done. You know it. <laughs> it's, called, it's called levels. Heavenly Father, thy will be done. <clears throat> Kabayada. Why are you all looking at me like that? <laughs> Ayadaba. So, what we are finding out is if God is almighty, then he will be father. He will be son and he will be spirit. Almighty should be able to be whatever he wants to be. Of course, except he's not almighty. If he's almighty, he has the capacity as almighty to be son, to be spirit, and to be father at the same time. That's the meaning of the word almighty. If he is almighty, he will be everything we need in redemption. Remember, he said, I am sufficient. Huh? Huh? Uh, hey guys, look at me. If somebody walked into this church and said, hey ladies and gentlemen in Power City, I am sufficient. I want to supply everything every one of you require." Make a list of how much you need quickly and send it across. I have the resources to supply. Okay? And you know his worth in the global economy. And every one of you writes how much you need. And he begins to dole out checks. He is not giving you because of you. He is giving you because of him. When God says I will do something, he's not waiting for anybody else. He's self-sufficient. So if he's self-sufficient and he needs a man that is sinless to die, he will be the man. If he's self-sufficient and he needs a spirit that can live in everybody at the same time, he will be the spirit. I don't know if I'm talking to somebody. Because if he's self-sufficient, it means when he moves, he moves with all the resources that makes him what he can be, when he wants to be, where he wants to be, how he wants to be. So when he wants to be a man, he removes what makes him God and keeps it secured. And then he puts on humanity. And he walks upon the earth, still having the ability to be the God that he is at the same time. I don't know if I'm talking to somebody. And if he wants to be spirit, he has the capacity to see it and then transform form into spirit and enter everybody. That's why it's called almighty. The self-sufficient one. The double-breasted God. He doesn't depend on you to get resources for help. No, he does not need help. The self-sufficient God cannot look for help from a man that is broke. He will depend on you to be the man that will die. Because he's self-sufficient, he will be the man that will die. And he will be the man that will rise. 
That's why you can say, I lay down my life by myself. I pick it up by myself. I don't. So when he showed up upon the face of the earth and they said, are you the king of the Jews? He said, you have said so. He said, I have the power to take away your life. He said, hold it, hold it, hold it. You're going too far. You, I, you cannot take my life unless I permit you. I have power to lay down my life. I have power to raise it up. Why? I am the almighty Shaddai, the self-sufficient one. I thought somebody would shout glory. He's God all by himself. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And he is the begotten son. If he's almighty, he should be father and son at the same time. Am I teaching? Am I teaching? Am I teaching? Am I teaching? Okay, sit down. Give me five minutes and I'll let you go. Mm -mm. If he is almighty, he will be everything he needs in redemption. He will be. If he's almighty, he is the I am that I am. He is the I will be what I will be. And then Moses tells us in Deuteronomy, on me, detrone your enemy. <laughs> detrone, detrone on me, chapter 6 verse 4. Why, why, why am I laughing in this? Detrone on me, chapter 6 verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. How many lords? How many God? I tell, I, I, tell, I, I tell people, Jesus is God. How can you say Jesus is God? If Jesus is God, why did he say, pray our father? Illiteracy can undress you in public. If he is the almighty, he will be what he will be. Because he is what he is. That's why we teach you that the Trinity is a concept of redemption. So if he will be the redeemer of man, every resource he will need to redeem man is within him. If he needs to be a man to redeem man, he has the ability to be a man to redeem man. If he has to be spirit to live inside man, he has the ability to be spirit to live inside man. It is still one God. One God, but having the resources that he requires to redeem man from his predicaments. Hear, O Israel, our, our God is one Lord. We know that there are no gods. We have only one God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 8, 4. How be it? There is not in every man this knowledge. So people have knowledge problem. Moses told them our God is, he is the Eckhart. He will fulfill what he has said in humanity. And in fulfilling it, he will give birth to a new creation. He will give birth to what? A new creation. Huh. Look at Genesis 17 verse 1. The Lord appeared to Abraham, Genesis 71. When Abraham was 90 years old and 9, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said unto him, I am the almighty God, walk before me and be thou perfect. Verse 2. And I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. Verse 3. And Abraham fell on his face and God talked with him, saying, so if I say my covenant is with you, what does he mean? It means I am going to walk through you. Abraham, I will walk through you. What is covenant? I'm going to do this through you. I'm going to do what I want to do through you. So let me ask you questions as I close. When he says father of many nations who is going to walk out that father of many nations god through who abraham so who is the father of many nations god what is abraham the one that god partners with to do it 
Is it clear? The one that God partners with to do it. So God's promise is a covenant. Covenant became Abraham because Abraham is not going to do anything. All Abraham will do is believe. And then God will walk through Abraham by faith to fulfill what God will do. So who is the father of many nations? God. Through who? Abraham. Now, God through Abraham. So if God will use Abraham, it therefore means that God will walk through Abraham's culture. Because Abraham can only understand God's communication within the confines of his environment that is used to. And since God has decided to walk through a man, it means therefore that God will use man's vocabulary to communicate with man and work out his plan through man. That culture of Abraham and that workings of God through Abraham is what we will see in the next service. Stand on your feet. Glory to God. Are you blessed? <laughs> For I delivered unto you first of all that which was delivered unto me. How that? Christ died for our sins according which scriptures? Is it getting clear? And that he was buried and that he rose again according which scriptures? You see where the scriptures that brother Paul establishes theology from. He took it from Abraham the deadness of Sarah's womb and how that out of the dead Isaac was born. Out of the death of Christ the new man is born. So the new creation realities of Abraham of, of Paul came from the teaching lesson of Abraham, Isaac, Hagar, Sarah, Ishmael that whole thing is where Abraham got his theology on death, burial and resurrection. He didn't get it from the death of Christ. He got it from the scriptures, which was validated by the practical death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Why? Because the scriptures are one. The scriptures are not two. When you look at it, everything synchronizes as one. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Lift your right hands up. Father, thank you for this morning. <clears throat> thank you for the privilege of learning, growing, and being equipped in the knowledge of the truth that is in Christ Jesus. Revelation knowledge growing big in the hearts of your people. Veils falling off, clarity coming. Thank you, Lord, that this life, the life of God, the life given to us by virtue of the resurrection, which makes us partakers, partakers of this family, the family of God, which was God's dream from Genesis, to have a family. And to be the father of that family. And we rejoice that today we are that family. The family of God. And therefore in the name of Jesus. I decree that everyone under the sound of my voice. Revelation knowledge grows big on your inside. Until nothing else matters. In the name of Jesus. We rebuke sickness. We rebuke disease. We rebuke infirmity. Satan get your hands off in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that your word builds up your people continually. And great grace is upon this family. In Jesus' precious name. And every believer says that amen on a note of finality. Amen. Well, can we go ahead and celebrate what we have in Christ? Celebrate the word. That sounds like five people celebrating in this. House. Glory! Glory! Amen! I tell you, friends, God's word has worked. God's word is not going to work. God's word has already worked. Glory to God. Amen. 
I tell you, friends, exciting days are ahead of us. I can't wait for Soteria season eight. I can't wait. I tell you. I, 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 I've just been looking at the, 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 the whole thing in my spirit and looking at the things we're going to be doing here. The month of July is, is brutal, man. We're going to be examining the, the, the emphasis of the Holy Spirit in salvation. Soteria 8. It's going to be brutal. Satan will be hiding in another planet. This planet will be too, too hot for him. Amen. Are you excited about it? I'm looking forward to it. All right, grab your offerings. We want to give in honor of God's word. Every time we hear the word in this house, we give in honor of God's word. We give as responsible sons and daughters of God. We give generously. We give excitedly. We give with joy because our father loves a cheerful giver. We do not give to get. We are not in a business transaction. We give to our father in honor for what he has done for us. We give in, in response to what Christ has done for us. And every time you give to this ministry and give to this house, especially those of you who are partners and friends of this ministry, I continue to say thank you to all of you because it is through your givings and support and prayers that we're able to get this gospel around the world. We're able to get this gospel to the nations of the earth. You know, yesterday, my, our coordinator for Europe, the guy, the, the brother who coordinates Power City, the whole of Europe and the East Africa, we are the regional coordinator for that. He called me last, yesterday and he, he was excited and I said, what's going on? And he says, Papa, I have testimonies all over this place. He said, you know, our campus coordinator in Spain, we're about to start a power city, Spain. And he says, the campus coordinator in Spain said, some guys who used to attend Assemblies of God Church stumbled on my teachings. And suddenly, they can't go again. Their appetite has changed. They're addicted to what I teach. And one of them called the coordinator for Spain that we are here to start who is just still putting things together and we do training before we launch. So the, the lady is going through her training and I'm sure they're watching. And he said, the guy said, in our church, we pay money before they teach us the word of God. We pay. We pay. That is you pay like a school before you are taught. He said, but I stumbled on Dr. Damina's teaching. He is teaching more serious things than anything we have ever had and it's for free. You come all the time. You see it for free. No, no charge. No fee. It's all over. YouTube, Facebook, free. And very serious information. He said, you know what? I have a building. Come and take it for Power City. I'm giving it for free. And then she said that another person called her and said, I hear that Power City is about to start. All the musical and sound equipments, I have bought them. You can come and carry them. The church has not started. All the equipments and the property is ready. And uh, my <laughs> regional coordinator was, I told him, it's just the beginning. Just watch. It's just the beginning. When people understand what Christ has done, when people see what Christ has done for them, material things will be of no value. People, you, you think it was a, a fairy tale that in the book of Acts, people went and sold houses, sold lands, brought everything and dropped them. You think, you think it's story story. It's not story story. It's reality. Because when people come in, in contact with the revelation of the depth of what Christ has done. You know, it's like sometimes when I study and study and I get into some level of insight and understanding. I, I want to jump and break the ground if possible. I just get excited. I want to float in the air. I, when you see, when you see the realities that are yours in Christ. When you see into it. When your eyes of understanding are open. To see the substance that Christ has made available. Huh. There's no way to explain. Sometimes I just break out in tongues. Blasting very crazy tongues. Hot tongues. Just. <laughs> amen. I said amen. Amen. It's amazing. And as we keep teaching, these things will keep opening up. Amen? I said amen. amen. When you see Jesus, money loses value. When you see Jesus, material things are of no value anymore. You can't compare the glory of natural. Yeah. Moses. You know Moses. Moses had more miracles than Jesus. 
Jesus alone walked on the water. When Peter tried, he sank. Moses split the Red Sea and took three million people to cross on dry ground. Jesus took bread and wine and bread and fish from a boy as point of contact and multiplied to feed 5,000. Moses put his hand in the sky and pulled down manna all over the land. <laughs> Moses. <laughs> that guy. <laughs> but you know what? After all those weight of miracles Moses saw, he still cried out, show me your glory. So there's something bigger than miracles, the glory of God. And ladies and gentlemen, today we have the glory of God in the face of Jesus. We carry it on our inside. Christ in you. So what Moses was crying and looking for, after all his miracle, you are the carrier of that in your inside. Oh, glory to God. Glory to God. The glory of this latter house is greater than the farmer. Somebody shout, somebody shout. Somebody shout, somebody Glory! See, I'm a carrier of God's glory. See, when you understand all of this, this world, this world suddenly means nothing. Thank you, Lord. Lift up your offerings. Let's give in faith. Online community, the banking details are scrolling. Television audience, radio audience, Mr. Michael Bush, read the banking details for you. Lift up your offerings. Father, we rejoice. And we thank you for the privilege of learning. The privilege of growing. The privilege of being equipped. The privilege of being grounded in the truths that are in Christ Jesus. I pray that as we give today, our offerings are a sweet smell before you. We give generously. We give with joy. Thank you for partners and friends of this ministry who sacrificially give towards the work of God. Who sacrificially support what we do around the world. Lord, I pray for everyone giving and all of our partners and friends that your needs are met according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. In the name of Jesus. And this week I decree Satan, take your hands off of God's property in the name of Jesus. All that is yours is released right now. The favors you need are released right now. The opportunities you need are released right now. The monies you re need are released right now. Receive it in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father, for answered prayer. We give you praise and glory in Jesus' precious name. And every believer says that amen on a note of final letter. Hey guys, on online 